So, um, Hi everyone, uh, I'm Rebecca Wright, uh, Director of Computer Science at Barnard, and happy to have you here today for our Computer Science Seminar. Uh, we are delighted to welcome uh, Professor David Bader of the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Uh, Bader is a distinguished professor and founder of the Department of Data Science and inaugural director of the Institute for Data Science at New Jersey Institute of Technology. Uh, before that, he served as founding professor as well as chair of the School of Computational Science and Engineering in the College of Computing at Georgia Tech. Um, his research interests are at the intersection of high performance computing and real world applications, including cybersecurity, massive scale analytics, and computational genomics. Uh, in 1998, uh, Dr. Bader built the first Linux super supercomputer that led to a high performance computing revolution with a current estimated total economic value of over 112. Uh, one, I can't even say the number, it's so big, $100 trillion uh, over the past 25 years. Um, he's been widely recognized for his work, including as a fellow of the IEEE, the ACM, the AAAS, and SIAM, a recipient of the IEEE Sydney Fernback Award, uh, as the 2022 Innovation Hall of Fame inductee of the University of Maryland's A. James Clark School of Engineering, as well as multiple Best Paper Awards. Um, he is recognized as a rock star of high performance computing by Inside HPC and as uh, one of HPC Wire's people to watch in both 2012 and 2014. Uh, he is the editor in chief of the ACM Transactions on Parallel Computing um, and also previously served as editor in chief of the IEEE Transactions on Parallel and Distributed Systems. Um, he is a co-founder of the Graph 500 list for benchmarking big data computing platforms and also um, has provided advice to the White House, most recently on the National Strategic Computing Initiative and the Future Advanced Computing Ecosystem. And uh, we are delighted to have him speaking to us today about solving global grand challenges with high performance data analytics. David. Thank you, Rebecca, for the nice introduction and also for those of you here in attendance from Columbia and, and Barnard, and also some students. Um, I know one, Tanvi, who's a, a sophomore here, so it's great to see some familiar faces. Um, real pleased to, to uh, give this talk to you today about solving global grand challenges with high performance data analytics. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my career and what really excites me and what interests me, and really the thread that's running through my entire passion for computing and data science, and then some applications that we're trying to enable. And I'm going to do so by going around this, um, th this uh, set of areas from what I think of as applications for enabling users, new architectural solutions, really engaging new faces of computing with the people involved. And the people are actually at this top uh, portion because the people are really the most important, whether it's those that we interact with in around the world globally or there are peers and, and students. Um, education, I've been a proponent of looking at creating new academic disciplines that really broaden the approach of computing across sciences, engineering, data science, and, and other areas. Um, software that drives everything that we're doing uh, performance, when we get to real world impacts, we have to look at how it works in the wild, how it works in practice. And then um, finally, through all of this, I've both pioneered innovation, but I've thought about democratizing computing and data science. The thread that ties all of this together is really how do we make computing and data science approachable to the broad community of any person around the planet who wants to be able to solve computational and data problems. So I think about that in this broad sense. So I'll start with the driving applications and I'll include some areas that I've worked in through the course of my career and then some new areas that I'm really excited by and, and thinking about now. So the first slide, and I'll go through some of these applications very, very quickly, but the hallmark is that they're often very challenging problems to solve because they are combinatorial in nature and the algorithms tend to be quite uh, challenging, but also, for instance, in this first project that I have up for the cyber infrastructure for computing evolutionary histories from sequenced organelles and organisms, uh, or the Cypress project, where we had 
uh, substantial support from an NSF uh, large award for understanding how to recompute the evolutionary histories of organisms. And this was a place where I innovated in terms of algorithms and software that was used by biologists, in fact, um, from some collaborators of mine, Bob Jansen at UT Austin, Linda Robison at, at Central Washington University, among others. And eventually the codes that we produced re released um, as open source and used by uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, government, uh, other research labs, and, and so on. I've also worked on a project supported by NIH on looking at RNA secondary structure prediction for very large uh, viruses such as influenza, HIV, polio, uh, tobacco mosaic graft virus, hantavirus, and, and so on, and having a more accurate computational approach, new algorithms for understanding the structure that then um, lets you understand the disease and also how these viruses evolve. For instance, influenza is one that we're very concerned about, very similar to COVID and other uh, viruses, HIV as well, to understand how they evolve so that we can look at new ways to prevent such spread. And this moves me into an area that I've had quite a substantial impact over many decades on large-scale graph problems. These are the types of problems that arise through many things that we interact with every day, whether it's our power distribution networks, where we are dependent on power for transportation, communications, food and water even, whether it's uh, cybersecurity on the internet, understanding social networks, map routing for ground transportation, shipping and distribution, and, and so on. I talked about evolutionary histories, or even looking at uh, the human proteome and understanding how to design um, uh, pharmaceuticals for the um, drug targets within these protein interaction networks are all areas where we have these massive graphs. Graphs have vertices, they have edges. There's many different types of graphs. They could be ones where the vertices and edges have types or not. The edges could be directed, there could be timestamps, or a whole variety of properties on those graphs. And through the, the years, I've come up with new algorithms, many new firsts, for solving some of the largest scale graph problems. As an example, there are many graphs coming from national security and intelligence. For instance, this is an image that was in communications of the ACM. Here, we have a pattern that we're looking for this pattern has two people living together. One rents a truck, one uh, buys fertilizer. They're observing a factory. And this is a pattern that could lead to um, a problem in the real world. And what you want to do is look at this observed act activity and solve this problem of pattern finding. This is also called subgraph isomorphism. It's believed to be a challenging problem, but That was on mine. It's gone. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's believed to be a challenging problem, and we look for heuristics and approximation algorithms to try to solve this. What I'm really excited by is algorithms that we've developed in, in this space. We are now starting to work with the Connectome project and researchers such as Jeff Lickman and Hans Peter Fister at Harvard for looking at a problem in neuroscience for image brains, whether it's Drosophila or mouse, and taking neuroscientists with patterns, and I'll talk more about this in my talk, where they're interested in finding those patterns within the, the brain. And this is a very computationally challenging uh, problem that we're looking at. I mentioned the electric power grid. We've worked on resilience of the US power grid, a very important problem. And it's not just one grid. There's multiple components and sections. Um, Texas is on their own um, grid as well, and there's pairing points between this grid, but it's very important to have a very robust uh, power grid. And we also do a lot of work with social network algorithms. We've applied those social network algorithms to, for instance, the social network of proteins in the human proteome. We've looked at the, um, at the time, about 
uh, 44,000 interactions in the human proteome, and we computed an analytic called betweenness centrality, which I won't go into too many details today, but this is sort of a cartoon of the, the results with the normalized betweenness centrality score, or how important is that protein in the network, and then the degree of the protein on the x-axis. So this is a log-log plot, and what we were able to do is essentially find a needle in a haystack. For instance, this protein, and I think PowerPoint um, moved that circle just a little bit here, um, but that protein that is at the top there has the highest betweenness centrality, but it's not the one on the right-hand side that interacts the most. It doesn't have the most interactions. This would be a hard protein to find in that um, protein interaction network. And it turns out that that protein has been implicated in a breast cancer. So through these types of analytics, we've worked with researchers at Emory and the CDC to look for sets of proteins that may lead to disease. Back in 2009, I used my algorithms to do the very first study of all public tweets. What we did was created a system where we ingested all of the public tweets into a supercomputer that was sitting at Pacific Northwest Natural Lab. We built a big graph and from that graph, we were looking at breaking events. And what we were trying to do is see, was there any good for Twitter? I mean, now many years have passed and we have different thoughts about Twitter and whether it's any good. But what we were trying to see is, could we keep people safe during some breaking event by figuring out where to dial in on Twitter to understand who was most uh, influential? So we looked at a pandemic spread at the time, or what was thought to be the H1N1 influenza virus. And through all of the tweets, we created a big graph in real time from about two months of data, September and October 2009. And then we ran the twin centrality on those graphs to find the important handles. And the ad hoc results, for instance, on this column here, gives the results that we found. And we were very pleased with what we saw. We saw the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, for instance, number one is CDC flu, number four is flu.gov, numbers 12 and 13 are CDC emergency and CDC e-health. That was great that we could find that signal in the noise. We also found commercial media like CNN, Time Magazine, and New York Times, and that was great that we saw people were being influenced by major media. But the one thing that we recovered, that we discovered were surprises that would happen as well. For instance, number three, official PACs. Um, has anyone heard of official PACs? I know it's a small room here. I bet nobody in this room would ever think of turning to this particular handle during a breaking pandemic event. Um, we've had one through, through COVID since then. Um, it's not who you think about tuning into. So we did some research. What is that? Why, why was that so influential? It turns out that this is the handle of a gamers convention called Penny Arcade. They were having a big convention in Seattle in fall 2009. And if you don't know about them, it's mostly adolescent males, not a group that you would listen to for any health advice. But it turned out that they're the first group on mass in the US to contract H1N1. And they started tweeting with each other, you know, my nose is running, my throat is scratchy, and you know, did you go to the doctor? Yes, it's confirmed H1N1. And this turned to be turned out to be the best signal for understanding that. And also they're tweeting with each other things like, hey, Joe, are, are you dead? Nope, I'm not dead. Are you dead? No. Nope. And it turned out, thankfully, the mortality rate was much lower for H1N1 than was predicted. So this is a great example of being able to do data science at this massive scale in real time to help keep people safe. I've also been able to work on projects, for instance, at Georgia Tech, I work with my colleague here, Gil Weinberg in music technology to take NVIDIA GPUs, graphics processing units, where I had a role in broadening their use to computational science and engineering, being able to do computing and also deep learning on GPUs. And we ran a deep learning network on this robot called Shimmy, where it could uh, improvise different musicians, different styles, for instance, jazz and so on. Don't know if the, the sound will work, but I can just play a second or hey, two Shimmy. here. 
Can you sing opera? No. So a very interesting project in computing plus music technology with accelerators and very interesting to um, students who are working in that area. Now, again, I, I said that the hallmark of my work is really trying to democratize um, computing. And one place where I've had substantial arc, um, impact is in terms of architecture. Very early in my career, I wanted access to supercomputers and these are computers that typically cost millions, maybe hundreds of millions, even billions of dollars, sit in very fancy machine rooms. But I wanted one at home. And I was a student. I didn't have a lot of money. Um, certainly not. I could buy a, a PC, a, a computer, a personal computer. But I didn't have the money to buy a supercomputer, let alone the power, the cooling, everything else. And so back. 25 years ago, I decided that I would build the very first all commodity based supercomputer. And I built this box in the lower left. And it was so successful at running applications that would typically run on, on supercomputers. I, being a very young Pathy member, decided to approach the National Science Foundation. And this guy, Larry Smart, who was running the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at Illinois, and asked, hey, do you have a couple hundred thousand dollars? I want to build one of these for the national computing community, the scientific community, so that they can also be able to run their applications. I want to democratize computing, make it economical to build supercomputers at a fraction of the cost of what they were um, charging in those days. And that led to this radical deployment of Linux supercomputers. This included not just assembling nodes and uh, processors together, but I had to come up with diagnostic networks. I had to port software for doing message passing. I had to work on compilers. I had to modify the kernels. I had to build a diagnostic network. I also lived um, pretty far from the university and had to figure out how to reboot the machine from home. Um, lots of things. And when you're rebooting, you can't overload that central uh, processor. Lots of technical issues to work through that, that I, I did uh, as a new professor. And Hyperion Research recently did a, a study of this and looked at the last 25 years. And as Rebecca mentioned in the introduction, concluded that this has had an impact of more than $100 trillion over the last 25 years. In fact, this architecture now is the predominant architecture for most supercomputers. All of the top 500 supercomputers in the world are using a design that's based on my innovation. And for this, I received in 2021, one of the highest awards in computing, the Sydney Fernbach Award. And last year, University of Maryland inducted me into their Innovation Hall of Fame. So I'm very happy about having that impact that's stood the, the test of, of time. So next, I want to go into people because it's really people that make all of this work. Software, architecture, these are just technologies. But what we want to do is make sure that people are living in a safer world, a more sustainable world, and that we're training students to be able to contribute to the world. So I went back in my archives and for preparing for this talk, I found this great photo of me. And this is my lab back in 2001. It was a newspaper, I had to scan this in. And I thought, oh my gosh, like, where are all these people today? What we, we did a, some of those projects that I mentioned with phylogeny reconstruction and others with some of these students. What are they up to today? And in fact, two of those students, um, Nina Weiss Bernstein over here and Laura Waymeyer, were undergraduate researchers. I got my start in research as an undergraduate RU. I've been passionate about always including undergraduates in my research and having them contribute in meaningful ways. Nina, I'll tell you a little bit more about her in a second, but she went on to earn her PhD and is at Los Alamos National Lab. Laura Waymeyer went on also to earn a PhD and is a neurologist, a neurology specialist in MD. This was 
you know, fascinating to see that they've done so well. Some of the other students, Paris Letter was a master's student. She's a software developer. Jing Yang Lu was a PhD student with me at the time. He's still at HHMI. Bei Wang was a master's student with me, went on to get her PhD and is working at Apple as a computer vision architect. And then these two over here, Min Zhu was a master's student with me, now a PhD uh, statistician at SAS. And finally, Zhang Li is a programmer at, at Penn State. So it's great to you know, see where everyone was up to, but something I wanted to point out, this first student, Nina, was actually a mentee of mine when she was a high school sophomore. I started working with her. She approached me and wanted to solve some supercomputing challenges from the National Laboratory, Sandia and Los Alamos. And I mentored her about 25 years ago. She went on to receive some awards. And then um, just tracking her through her career, I was able to publish her when she was in, with her when she was an undergraduate in my lab. She completed a PhD. And now she's receiving some incredible awards at, at Los Alamos. So in discussing with, um, I, you know, asking her for a picture to be able to, to talk about her, she said, working with you and having you as a mentor for a supercomputing challenge project definitely helped keep me in STEM. So, I mean, that this is a success and I can't believe, you know, 25 years have passed since initially working with her. That's what, what I'd like to see um, with many of my students. This is my, my current group at New Jersey Institute of Technology. I have a research faculty uh, sheet who we do. I have a number of PhD students. They all have determined that my lab is the um, multicultural lab for the diversity that we have with, within the lab. So um, we have just a, a great set of students. But also, as I mentioned throughout my career, I always love to have undergraduate researchers contribute meaningfully and equally within my lab. Much of the work that we do, students can do using um, online res resources, their, their laptops, um, collaborative notebooks, and, and so on. And they do algorithm development, all, all of my, my students do, and uh, data science. So I have four great undergraduate research assistants. And I still maintain some high school interns, which I think are phenomenal. In fact, um, uh, Anya, um, both of these students have um, graduated. Um, Pranav is going to Johns Hopkins. Anya is coming to Columbia. So just a, a great set of uh, students here. And then I've also mentored some postdocs who have all gone on to some incredible careers and joined faculty at, at a number of universities. So it's been a very rewarding um, part of uh, growing all of the, these people and seeing their successes, as well as having PhD students that have continued to come out of the pipeline and go on and do great things. Some are faculty, some are working with um, research labs and, and companies. So um, moving on to education, one opportunity at Barnard looking at a growing program is to really think about at the start uh, of a program how to create something that that's new. I've been very fortunate to innovate in academia twice now. So I joined Georgia Tech in 2005 with a vision to create the School of Computational Science and Engineering. And that's looking at the interface between computing and sciences, engineering, management, and other disciplines, and how to create new academic programs that will really create the types of students that will go on to solve problems that are grand challenges in the world. So to do so, I created um, with my colleagues a master's and PhD program that is actually joined between nine departments, computing just being one of them, where students get a very broad education for solving problems in the real world. We also launched an online master's of analytics that was joined between operations research, computing, as well as our business school, and built that to be the, the top research school at Georgia Tech in terms of research expenditures per faculty. So this was a true startup within academia, and this really gave me the, the bug for creating new uh, endeavors in academia, which is often very slow to innovate. I moved to NGIT in 2019 with a vision to create a new interdisciplinary institute 
for data science and then go on to create a department of data science that we launched in fall 2021. And we had an existing master's program for data science, but I was very interested in creating a new bachelor's program in data science, which I was able to do in short order and launch that in fall 2021. And then this semester, we were able to launch the PhD in data science. This has been a partnership with both computing as well as our mathematical sciences department. So this is spread across two different colleges at NGIT. And the Institute for Data Science is also very collaborative. We have about 40 participating faculty across four or five colleges at NGIT. This really gets me thinking about new academic programs and creations. We're all familiar with ChatGPT. I think everyone on, on the street is. And it leads us to really think about what's going to happen when every discipline, every sector of the economy is now impacted by machine learning and AI and data science, whether it's the tech sector or um, fintech, but also entertainment and gaming, fashion, food production, manufacturing, security, transportation, smart hub, smart ports, all of these areas are being impacted by these very recent developments. And I think it's time that we rethink about computing and where computing can take us for solving these types of problems. I've been very fortunate also to be able to work with a number of government agencies and also many uh, industries and, and companies across the uh, spectrum of, of areas, not just the, the tech sector, but some areas, for instance, New York Times, Terry's Digital Real Estate, Bayer, a pharmaceutical company, um, and, and so on. So it, it's been, you know, just really fantastic to be able to work with real companies and organizations. They have problems that matter to this world, and those are what we focus on and what we try to solve. So very quickly, software also drives what we're doing. Just a very, for the sake of time, just some brief uh, contribution, where back as a um, graduate student or postdoc, I came up with a methodology for programming multi-core clusters. Essentially, everything that we see in computing today includes multi-core processors that are interconnected together. And I came up with the first programming methodology for optimizing algorithms on these architectures that are now just ubiquitous today. And performance is something that matters. When I talk about performance, when I look at real world applications, it may be the running time is the first thought, but it also may be the cost that we're optimizing for. We want to make sure what we're doing is economically viable and efficient. It may be power. We don't want our devices, for instance, my phone, I have to be very careful about power so it doesn't burn my leg when, when it's in my pocket or have my laptop here start a fire on the table in front of you. So power is a first class citizen as well. In the course of my career, I've been able to really look at, again, democratizing computing and look at technologies that were commodity that everyone on this planet should be able or could be able to access. There was a chip that drove the PlayStation 3, the Sony PS3, called the IBM Cell Broadband Engine Processor. And I had a hand in this processor and stood up for Sony, Toshiba, and IBM. The very first center focused on this processor back in 2006. So anyone with their PlayStation at home could then dual boot it and run Linux on, on that machine and program it. And we also used that chip to build some very high efficient clusters. This was the new era of accelerators. This chip was able to accelerate real applications and get real performance. So um, again, just a fantastic use of a commercial technology like this PlayStation 3 chip. And it also was the chip that drove the first petascale supercomputer in the United States, launched at Los Alamos in 2009. I then worked with NVIDIA on their very first DARPA project to take 
the chip that was doing graphics, the GPU, and repurpose it and design a chip that would be very efficient for doing acceleration of computational science and engineering applications. This has led to the chips that we see today, the GPUs that are driving this AI revolution, doing 80% of the workloads of trading models are running on the chips that we designed under this ubiquitous high performance computing program from DARPA a number of years ago. So I was really proud to be the application specialist for NVIDIA on this um, big DARPA project. And then through the course of my work, I've had many first and scalable algorithm design and implementation, often parallel algorithms for um, single source shortest path. The very first parallel between a centrality algorithm and analyt an analytic that's very good at taking a graph and finding important vertices in, in that graph. Community detection that won a Dimax um, implementation challenge, uh, mix uh, challenge, but also had the pleasure of running some Dimax implementation challenges. Um, streaming community in its algorithms and many of the best performing graph algorithms for GPUs. In fact, NVIDIA's KuGraph package includes a lot of the expertise and um, software that came out of our lab. Now today, as I look at what I'm, I'm doing currently in future directions, I think about data in terms of these two axes. I have in a data set objects on this x-axis from known objects on the left to unknown objects on the right. And then I have patterns from unknown patterns on the bottom to, sorry, known patterns on the bottom to unknown patterns on the top. And this, uh, these two axes, axes divide the space into four quadrants. And we can look at those different quadrants. And I'll, for the sake of time, I'll go through this a little bit fast. But whenever we have known objects and known patterns, we've had database technology like relational databases since the 1980s that let us solve problems in those spaces. On the off diagonals, I have known objects and unknown patterns. This is a motif of this maybe in cybersecurity, where I have an organization and the chief information security officer finds that an employee has tripped some security wire and wants to know, was that an accident or are they up to no good? Have they accessed files they shouldn't try to uh, circumvent some security mechanisms, and they want to explore around that particular interaction graph. On the lower right is a uh, um, image that, that I showed earlier in the talk where we're doing subgraph isomorphism, where we have a known pattern and we're looking in unknown data to see if we can find a version of it. Question? Yeah, sorry to interrupt. I I just want to make sure I'm clear on what you mean by patterns and objects. So by patterns, you mean access patterns? data access patterns? Oh, by patterns, what I mean is a template within the graph. So uh, I, I okay. mean an actual pattern where I have vertices and, and I, edges, I see, yeah, structure. some structure that I'm looking okay. for. And then the objects, you mean um, the, the population? The vertices or the edges themselves. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so typically structure. in the types of graphs I've shown here, we, I think of this as a knowledge graph, for instance, where vertices represent nouns, people, places, and things, and edges represent the connections or relationships between them. And often we have attributes with the vertices and or attributes with the edges, and we could have many different types of, of graphs. And I know I, I, for the sake of this talk, I cut out a lot of the background material, but we can have many different types of graphs. For instance, we could have edges with timestamps on them or not. We could have directionality on the edges. We could have different types of vertices, like this is a person vertex, this is a vehicle vertex, and so on. So you could think of it like a, a knowledge graph. Yeah, it's uh, the world, is the universe of graphs. On Correct. Quadrants. Yeah, so I, I just have sort of a cartoon of a type of problem from each. And vertical database technology in the 90s help with some of these types of problems. But where I'm really, really, really excited is by this fourth quadrant of unknown unknowns. This is where you're handed a large data set and you have no idea what you're holding. This is where all the surprises sit. And often, for instance, machine learning doesn't help us find a pattern that's a novel pattern because we haven't seen it before. So what I mean in, in this area is, for instance, a zero day cyber attack where no one has seen that type of attack before may sit in this quadrant in data. Or this could be the outbreak of the next 
uh, COVID-19 like virus that creates a pandemic and we're sure to get other pandemics in this world if history is any predictor, but we don't know what to look for if we haven't seen it before. So these are the types of problems that we may be looking for or in an insider threat within a company that um, hasn't done anything wrong up until the point where they do something egregious. So these are often very costly areas um, and we're trying to understand what's in these massive data sets. I think of this as exascale streaming graphs and these types of problems come from a variety of areas. I've already talked about a number of these within healthcare, understanding massive social networks, pandemic spread, transportation and evacuation during um, um, different types of events, business intelligence, systems biology, even predicting the full scale economic, social and political activities of entire nations due to policy changes can fall into these types of problems. Now, I've received an award from the National Science Foundation, currently funded about um, two and a quarter million dollars to develop open source software to allow the democratization of supercomputing for massive scale data science. I'm really, really excited by this project because what we're trying to do is take data scientists and analysts who know just basic Python. They're, they're not computer scientists. They know very little um, coding. And I want them to be able to man manipulate data sets that are enormous, tens, maybe a hundred terabytes that you typically need a supercomputer for. But the gap to have someone program a supercomputer is really a heroic step of doing parallel programming and accessing that computer, even having the resources to have that, that supercomputer. So I want anyone who's got a laptop and a Jupyter notebook to be able to do massive scale data science. And this is important across many different areas. Um, I'll just go through some of these bit very quickly. For instance, in healthcare, we may want to find patterns within clinical patient records it is one example. And our open source software, Arachne, is what's pictured over here doing the graph analytic to build these graphs and um, where I have the patients as vertices, the edges are shared clinical features, and so on, and using algorithms like community detection in order to find these types of patterns. Modeling pandemic spreads, Again, looking for important um, vertices. That this is a typical graph where the red vertices are infected people, the dark blue are exposed, yellow are hospitalized, the green are those that are, are um, recovered, and then unfortunately there are some people who have passed away and trying to understand um, this spread. And also, for instance, who do you inoculate first, first responders and others, who is especially susceptible and so on. And these data sets can have millions or even trillions of, of vertices in them. Uh, contact tracing is another example. So I think everyone's probably familiar with contract tracing at, at this point, but you know, often we're looking for high between us and Charlie, really important um, individuals within these types of networks. Um, population health data analysis is another great area where our algorithms could, could be used on these types of very, very large data sets with terabytes of data. When I get to this talk, I, I take a, a moment to pause and recognize one of my collaborators, Mike Merrill, who um, we worked on, on this vision together, and he sadly passed away last fall. Um, and I promised him any time I, I talk about Arcuda and Arachne that uh, I will uh, always remember his contributions to this project and, and to the nation. So the idea that we want to merge together was using something like Python, which is the lingua de franca for computer scientists and uh, data scientists, and have them be able to use something of extremely high performance, like this chapel compiler that is here it says Cray Chapel. A few years ago, HPE acquired Cray. So this is now the HP Cray Chapel compiler. This is a compiler that the US government funded under a DARPA high productivity computing systems program about 20 plus years ago. 
And we decided that we would put these two to use and have this illusion of, let, let me click that off on my screen. Okay, have that illusion of this high productivity. Anyone should be able to do data science with Python, but then have the capability that they're actually manipulating sight unseen these massive data sets on a supercomputer. So we built out this open source framework. It's on GitHub. We want everyone in the world to be able to use this, where we have a user down here that is interacting with their Jupyter notebook, their collaboratory, maybe writing Python code. And this is interacting in near real time. But what's truly happening is that big data is sitting on some back end in the cloud, maybe a supercomputer. The target could also be a cluster or laptop, a um, shared memory machine, doesn't necessarily have to be a supercomputer, but Chapel targets any device. And what we do is all the heavy lifting, the algorithms, and what I have outlined over here are the graph analytics, breadth for search, connected components, KTRAS, and more. And these modules are what we're calling Arachne, the Greek word for spider. And then this overall project is called Arcuda, the Greek word for bear. So this is like a NumPy and Pandas replacement for these components. And these components are like a network X replacement, if you will. All of the software is open source. In fact, we have, I have high school students and undergraduate students contributing. Our changes get checked in. And within about two weeks, this is tech transferred where there are analysts who are using our code. Right now, there's probably about anywhere from a dozen to 20 analysts that are using our code that our students are writing and giving us feedback on their performance and new types of algorithms that would really help in this um, in these challenges. So our major contributions are this productivity through Python with high performance backed by Chapel for some very challenging graph analytics. Again, everything is open source, including that Chapel compiler from HPE Cray. It's not um, it's not closed source. You can get the source to that Chapel compiler as well. So it's a completely open source project. And I thought that that was very important to be able to democratize large scale data science and have everyone be able to, to use it. In fact, we've been building out a number of graph algorithms in the last two years. We first had to be able to do basic graph algorithms before we could get to some more complicated ones. So breadth first search is taking a graph starting with the vertex and then discovering all of the other vertices in that graph. Connected components returns the maximal um, set of vertices that are all connected to each other and labels vertices in each component the same. Trust analytics is a uh, circuit for doing community detection where we're looking for the triangle support between uh, subsets of the vertices, Jakar coefficients, counting triangles, triangle centrality. You start to see the word triangle a lot. Um, a triangle very simply is three vertices that are all connected by edges. And it turns out that finding those triangles in a graph is very useful for high level analytics because where you have more communities, you expect to see more triangles in those sections. And many of the analytics that uh, analysts are looking for, like trust analytics, clustering coefficient, and others are based on finding triangles. So we have some very new and efficient triangle counting algorithms. And in fact, a very new analytic from a colleague, uh, Paul Burkhardt at the National Security Agency is something called triangle centrality that turns out to be very useful to find um, influential vertices in hierarchical organizations. And again, it's related to first counting triangles. So we're continuing to work to produce new analytics. It's very simple to use. And um, I know this is a little bit hard to see. I have extra glasses if anyone <laughs> Um, so you don't have to see too much on the screen, but this is using Arcuda. Um, this is, uh, basically we connect to an Arcuda server. I've just talked through what's here. We can read in the graph or ingest the graph in various different ways. We can query the graph. If we have a small enough component, we can view it. This is, um, for instance, network X viewing the graph. 
maybe we've run an algorithm to figure out the max degree, and then we may want to run another algorithm to run this uh, breadth first search from that max degree vertex. So it's very easy. We have, uh, this is a small example that I could show on my, my slide, but we have to do some magic to make sure that the big data stays on that backend supercomputer and just, you know, small data is able to come to their front end to give them results and have them be able to interact in real time with these massive, massive data sets. So th this has been a, a huge success um, with our partners that, that we're working with, real analysts using tens to hundreds of, of terabytes of data. And we've been able to test this both on real world graphs and synthetic graphs. Um, I, I don't have time to go through all of the details, but essentially for the real world graphs, the, these are some of the performance numbers where the, this is the size of the graph in terms of number of edges on a log scale. So um, to the 15th up to, to the 30th. And this is the execution time in seconds also on a log scale. So it's a log log plot. And we see the algorithms over here all performing right where we'd like to see them doing quite well. This top blue curve over here, the most expensive step is graph construction. So this is taking a graph from an input file and then putting it into a graph data structure. We had to actually invent a new graph data structure for all of this to work. So um, in Arcuda, this base package that we're developing off of, the only data structure is a one dimensional array. We can't do complicated data structures unless we build them up from 1D arrays. And so we're, we're, that's why that step is expensive. But once you build that graph, then you can run these analytics on it very, very efficiently. And the way that this is used, Arcuda is creating that graph on a server, and then many analysts can connect to that graph and run their analytics on that very same, same graph. And the, the same with synthetic graphs as well. This has resulted in a number of publications, and there are undergraduates and um, high school students who are affiliated and um, working on, on these papers and work. The canonical paper is one from last year, actually HPEC, that talks about this overall package. Um, Arachne, that my PhD student Oliver is really um, engineering for his PhD dissertation. So finally, just to tell you about what I'm thinking about for the future, I'm currently trying um, to take this Arachne package and look at other problems, other collaborations that we can engage in now that we're able to solve these incredibly challenging problems. One is working on the Connectome project. I am talking with Jeff Lickman and Hans-Peter Pfister at Harvard and trying to take neuroscientists who have patterns within connectomes, for instance, Drosophila, fruit fly brain, moving on to the mouse brain, and ultimately the human brain, to understand the um, connections between neurons and pathways as um, brains develop and language is formed and other, uh, other aspects. So it's just very, very complex dealing with these data sets. Right now, the Drosophila brain in the Connectome project has about 50,000 neurons. So you could think of that as 50,000 vertices and 133 million edges or um, connections between those neurons. An average neuron may have, for instance, two to um, human brains have about 7,000 connections per neuron. That's high degree vertex and you're just given these connectomes with many, many, many high degree vertices. So finding a pattern in them is a challenge and we're working on that right now. We're also um, working in the area of scientometrics with collaborators, George Chaco and Tandy Warnow at University of Illinois, trying to understand novelty in science, uh, impact peer review, knowledge diffusion and research community structure from data that includes all the published literature of the authors, co-authors, funding agents, references, and so on, and being able to use that to understand how science is growing. And finally, I'm very excited to do um, graphs for another area in 
biology, biological networks. My collaborator is actually my brother Joel at Johns Hopkins. Um, he and I have talked for decades about doing something together, and we finally um, are working on a project to understand normal processes like tissue regeneration and healthy aging and also abnormal uh, disease processes like cancer. In this project, we're looking at pathways within a cell, signaling pathways, and we're using maximum likelihood, sorry, sorry maximum flow and perturbations to max flow a graph algorithm for understanding how resilient pathways are and how they break down in the, the face of disease like um, particular cancers. So this is really exciting to be able to apply these graph algorithms across a broad set of areas that have just profound impact. So um, finally, to conclude, all of this democratization of, of computing and all of these innovations really require innovation that occurs at the interface between traditional boundaries. To solve all of these problems, we've had to train individuals to think across boundaries, multidisciplinary with other disciplines to be able to have this type of impact. And solving the global grand challenges really requires broadening, broadening the communities that can leverage computer and data science. We have to engage with the world and engage with all of the people on this planet to solve some of these very, very important problems. So again, thank you for listening to my talk. My last slide is just acknowledging, again, the students who have contributed, um, especially some of my um, early career students on the bottom row, where I expect to come back in 25 years from now and see that they're, you know, many of our thought leaders in, in these spaces. So again, thank you, and I'd be glad to take any questions. So questions obviously in the room, you know what to do. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, we uh, are mic'd up so we can hear you, uh, or speaker up, whatever, uh, we can hear you. So um, if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to, um, to, uh, to ask it uh, by unmuting yourself, or you can put something in the chat and I will uh, relay it um, as needed. So, so, uh, so thanks for talking, we'll go obviously, but it, so a, a key paradigm for you seems to be the graph as a, as a fixed or a given entity. And I, I wonder how that works with maybe some of your examples where the where a there is a, there is some a arbitrary decision making in terms of what's and what be considered an edge, for instance, when you're comparing patients and deciding who are which pairs are similar or not. Um, how does that play out in, and how valuable are the graphs when you when you're trying to uh, make all these decisions? So that's a fantastic question. And often when I talk about graphs and a talk at this level, I'm using it in a very generic sense. In many of these cases, we build different types of graphs. And what we primarily look at is what do you want to solve? On that graph, what, what are you looking for? And then what are the right structures that are either going to go in directly into that graph or a derived product from that graph? For instance, I could think about a um, knowledge graph that, so let me give you another example. So here's my phone. Um, I make a call to you, and what I'd like to see is a graph that has me and you as vertices and an edge between us where I called you. In fact, that may not be what I actually see. What I see is here's an equipment, a smartphone. It's got a subscriber number on it. So that's an edge between the phone and the subscriber account. Then that connects to a tower. So I see that as an edge. The towers then pass around um, information and that the call to goes off a, another tower to your subscriber number to your device and you. So there may be 20 hops between me and you. So one graph for communications may have all of these edges and that may be important when I'm trying to look at where to place the new cell tower. I wanna to know all of that. But if I just wanna see if we're friends, I want a single edge between us to say we're friends because we, we talk. 
Um, and so in many of these cases, especially when I'm working with industry, I go and I ask the um, folks who are trying to solve problems, like what problem are you trying to solve? And based on that, there may be different ways to organize the graph. For instance, I live at an address. That address could be an attribute of me as a vertex in the graph, or that address could be a different vertex in the graph that's of locations or places. And depending on the types of queries I want to ask, maybe it makes sense, it's more efficient to include it one way or the other. It's very problem dependent, and so I do a lot of work on different problems to figure out what's the most efficient way. All of those examples, or at least with the addresses, contain the same information, but one may be just more efficient when it comes to designing algorithms, especially large scale algorithms, as to where I'll get the empirical performance from. Um, when you're talking just towards the end about the fruit fly brain, um, and you mentioned like 77,000 neurons for the very high. These are the backup slides. Oh, <laughs> gosh. How many backup slides did I put here? Okay, here we go. Yeah, so, the, so right. Uh, the, the, I think, did I hear you say 77,000 ish neurons? Or um, 50,000 in what's um, sequenced now, about 50,000 and 133 million um, edges in, in the graph. So um, you had some other graphs earlier in your talk with like two to the 30 something vertices. So by those standards, this seems like a very small graph. So, so I feel like I'm missing something. It's small um, because it's less than a square millimeter for a fruit fly brain. But when you get up to a mouse that's a square centimeter or so, then the complexity increases. And now if we start talking about humans, my gosh, it, it probably will be decades before we can image down to the neuron every um, a human brain. And then we're not interested in just a single brain. We'd like to see imaging of the brain over time through development periods, um, different individuals. Right now, the imaging is for a single fly brain. Um, hopefully that fly was a typical fly and not, you know, after spending many, many years doing that imaging and coming up with a graph for it, it's just one representative individual. The other thing I want to say, even though it's, it sounds pretty small, if I want to do the way I got involved with this project with Jeff Lickman and, and Hans-Peter Pfister was that the subgraph isomorphism, they had neuroscientists who draw a little pattern with two or three neurons some arrows for connections, they can run that. They get up to four neurons and suddenly it takes 10 hours. They want to do, you know, five to eight or 12 neurons. It's intractable. Even on one fruit fly. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And hence, um, that, that's where I come up with approximations, heuristics, parallelism, and other techniques. For instance, this isn't just a generic graph. I know that it's contained in some 3D space. And so I may be able to leverage the Euclidean geometry. Um, I know that everyone is high degree. I may be able to leverage that in some way, but that's very challenging. I also have a pattern. I may be able to filter the graph. So rather than just call motif finding or subgraph isomorphism as a, a subroutine, I may be able to use facts and attributes of that particular connectome graph to simplify and make it tractable to patterns that have 12, 15, 20 neurons in them. And that's where the neuroscientists want, want to get. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thanks for the talk. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering, uh, can you say more about, let's say, what challenges you face when you're trying to, let's say, model a temporal evolution? Uh, like so over time, let's say you add um, new members to some network. Um, what what happens uh, with your data structure? Like how do you design such a data structure such that it's resilient to that? Great question. Um, and I didn't include it in this talk, but I'm sure I have some backup slides on an effort that I have called Sting. And maybe I'll I'll find I don't know I'll leave this this one up here. <laughs> maybe it, here it is. Um, this is a slide I'm looking for. I created an infrastructure for looking at streaming graphs or graphs that change over time. Didn't have time to talk about it here. 
in this talk, but many real world challenges have data in motion. And I wanna be able to understand these emerging graphs. I'll, I'll jump around just a little bit, I'll go back here. Today, we typically get a static data set. You know, here's your graph, someone hands it to you. And usually it's handed to you because something bad's happened and you're trying to figure out what happened. So this is when you're trying to report on the news and um, you know a company was uh, penetrated and they some attacker got in, exfiltrated or stole their IP, and you want to figure out how they get in, what they take, and all this other stuff. But where you'd really like to be is out in front of the problem, predictive analytics, so that as data is going past you, you're able to make decisions before you're trying to collect up all your log files and figure out what happened. So we did create an infrastructure that we worked on for a long time. One of the first infrastructures for a data structure for streaming graphs, and that's what the Stinger is, where you could have a graph being updated in near real time. We were looking at millions of updates per second, and then we had analytics that could attach to that large graph and be able to detect various changes in the graph. It led to a lot of very interesting research. For instance, we could track static properties over time, like number of connected components, or who is the highest between a centrally vertex and the graph. But there's brand new analytics that are only in the temporal space of graphs, like discover an emerging community, or tell me when some other community is going to dissipate or fizzle out. So purely temporal graphs. And um, those types of analytics are used in, uh, for instance, we've worked in some of these areas so over here, looking at insider threats within large organizations, um, defending the nation against cyber-based attacks and others. So again, very, very challenging area it would be a whole other talk or sets of talks on, on the work that, that we've done there. But, but great question. Any more questions? All right. Seeing none then, uh, let us close our speaker.